Hey everyone, it's Masood. Welcome back to Med School Moose. This is going to be USMLE Step 2 CK High Yield Facts Part 5. Remember, this is randomized rapid fire facts relevant for USMLE Step 2 CK as well as for Comlex Level 2 CE. Hopefully, you've had a chance to watch all the other videos in the series. Be sure to subscribe to receive all of these videos as well as my additional videos. That being said, let's get into it. What is the best initial test to diagnose mesenteric ischemia? This is going to be a CT scan of the abdomen. On the CT scan, you might see some bowel wall edema or air within the bowel wall that is abnormal, and that can be a sign of mesenteric ischemia. X-ray can also be used. It's not as good of a test. You're probably not going to see that and CT scan as answer choices. It may be the answer if CT scan isn't there, but just know that the best initial test to diagnose mesenteric ischemia is a CT scan of the abdomen. That being said, what is the most accurate test to diagnose mesenteric ischemia? I feel like I say it every single time, but you have to be sure that you're reading these questions very slowly. They might be asking about the best initial test, the most accurate test, the gold standard test. These can all be different things. So the most accurate test to diagnose mesenteric ischemia is actually CT angiography, a CTA of the abdomen and pelvis, because this is the best type of exam to diagnose arterial occlusive disease, which is essentially what mesenteric ischemia is. So be sure that you know those distinctions and that you're reading these questions very carefully. What physiologic factors can cause a hypercoagulable state? Remember, there's a ton of different things that can cause hypercoagulability, acquired genetic, etc. There's only two physiologic factors, though, and those are pregnancy and age. This is why when we have pregnant patients that come in with shortness of breath, when they come to the emergency department, one of the things that we at least need to consider is a possible a pulmonary embolism because they are hypercoagulable. So just be sure that you know that and think about those kinds of conditions in these pregnant patients as well as these older patients. What is the best initial test to diagnose a G6PD deficiency? Again, best initial test. This is going to be a CBC with a smear. Patients with a G6PD deficiency, they can show features of hemolysis like the bite cells, the Heinz bodies that we've talked about in my step one videos. Remember, Heinz bodies are inclusions of damaged hemoglobin within red blood cells. So if you do the smear and you're able to see those cells, that is the best initial test for diagnosing a G6PD deficiency. Getting into some ortho here, what is a Montegia fracture? This is going to be a fracture of the proximal ulna as well as a subluxation of the radial head. You may remember that mugger mnemonic from when you were studying for step one. We're going to touch on that in a minute. But of course, the next question has to be, what is a Galeazzi fracture? That is the other fracture associated with this. This is going to be a fracture of the radius with dislocation of the radial ulnar joint. So that mugger mnemonic, you know, the M and the U are next to each other. So Montegia is a fracture of the ulna and then the g and the r are next to each other so galeazzi is a fracture of the radius and here is your visual stimulus this is the montegia fracture obviously you can see the fracture of the ulna and the subluxation the dislocation of the radial head here this is the montegia fracture and then this is going to be the galeazzi fracture this is going to be the fracture of the radius which you can see right here as well as the dislocation of the ulna. So be sure that you know the differences between those two types of fractures. What is the most accurate test to diagnose osteomyelitis? The most accurate test is going to be a bone aspiration with gram stain and culture. Remember, osteomyelitis is typically a clinical diagnosis at first. That's usually sufficient for management to start antibiotics, but the most accurate test is going to be an aspiration and a gram stain and culture to actually see that bacteria growing within that bone sample. What two electrolyte abnormalities are seen in rhabdomyolysis? This is going to be hyperkalemia and hyperphosphatemia. Remember when you have this rhabdo, a patient that's been out in the hot sun for a while, they're not drinking water, a patient that's just ran a marathon, something like that. They're going to have this muscle breakdown, this muscle necrosis, and they can develop hyperkalemia as well as hyper phosphatemia. Remember, anyone that's into the emergency medicine side of things, the hyperkalemia is the thing that we worry about the most, can cause a lot of heart problems, a lot of cardiac issues. So that's something that needs to be managed and that can be seen in rhabdo. What is the most frequent presenting symptom of tuberous sclerosis? This is going to be seizures. Remember, tuberous sclerosis is an autosomal dominant condition characterized by those ash leaf spots, the hypopigmented lesions, which we've absolutely talked about in my US Assembly Step 1 High Yield Images videos. The most frequent presenting symptom of this condition, though, is going to be seizures. 
Let's talk about kids now. At what age do children usually develop a pincer grasp? Remember the pincer grasp, they're able to kind of use their thumb and their index finger and grab really small items. And this usually occurs at around 12 months or so. Another question that I have here, at what age can children usually copy a circle? This is going to occur at about three years. Remember, there's a lot of different developmental milestones that are relevant for step one, as well as for step two to kind of ensure that children are developing appropriately. Let me know in the comments if you want me to make a separate video covering these developmental milestones because there's a lot of different ones. There's a lot of different categories, uh, but I'm just covering a few of them here. So children can usually copy a circle. They can usually draw a circle at about three years old. Another one that I have here, at what age do children usually begin rolling over? This is typically around four to five months. The reason that this one is particularly important is because this can be seen, and it's a really important question to ask in cases of non-accidental trauma, also known as child abuse. The classic vignette is you have uh, parents bring a child in, they said that they fell off the bed, but they're only two or three months old. If you know these developmental milestones, you would know that they probably can't roll over. They probably can't do that until about four to five months. So that's a little bit suspicious. So that kind of raises red flags. So that being said, there is definitely some relevance to knowing these developmental milestones. And this is one of the common ones that we need to know about in the emergency department. Also, of course, very highly testable for step two CK and for level two CE. All right, moving on now, high urine levels of blank are diagnostic of carcinoid syndrome. This is going to be high urine levels of 5-HIAA. Remember, this is a serotonin metabolite. This is actually the best initial test for the diagnosis of carcinoid syndrome, so be sure that you know that. Is diabetic ketoacidosis more common with type 1 or type 2 diabetes? We really want to know the distinctions between what severe conditions can occur in type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and in this case, diabetic ketoacidosis is more common in type 1 diabetes. HHS, on the other hand, the hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state, that is more common in type 2 diabetes. So make sure that you know those differences. And to go along with that, what glucose level is typically seen in DKA and HHS? Because there is a difference and we want to know that as well. DKA, we typically see a blood glucose level of greater than 250 and HHS, it's typically higher, greater than 600. Of course, this is not absolute. I have certainly seen patients in DKA and their blood glucose has been in the four, five, six hundreds. But typically just on the exams, you want to know the glucose level for DKA is usually several hundred less than it is for HHS. What is the typical causative organism of a hordeolum? Remember, this is a painful eyelid gland infection, also known as a sty. And the most typical causative organism is going to be Staph aureus. Moving on here, does bullous pemphigoid have a positive or a negative Nikolsky sign? Bullous pemphigoid has a negative Nikolsky sign. Remember, bullous pemphigoid, this is the condition where there are autoantibodies formed against the hemidesmosomes. It's characterized by these firm, tense boule on the skin, and it has a negative Nikolsky sign. These boule do not rupture when they are rubbed, so be sure that you know that. Some more nuanced questions here. What is the location of a Spigelian hernia? This is not a very common hernia, but of course, those obscure things have... As we've talked about before, are really highly testable on these exams. The location of a Spigelian hernia is lateral to the lateral border of the rectus muscle. Now, what does that mean? Here's a little bit of a visual stimulus. We have our rectus muscle here, the lateral aspect of this, the lateral border of this. This is where we're going to see the Spigelian hernias. You see it's kind of pointing that out right in this area here. And now, what is the etiology of an epigastric hernia? This is going to be due to weakening of the linea alba. Going back to that same picture, we have the linea alba right here in the center. Of course, epigastric hernias typically occur in the epigastric region, and it's because of weakening of this tissue right here of the linea alba. Guys, as always, thank you so much for watching. Click here on the left to watch Step 2 CK High Yield Facts Part 4, and click here on the right to go all the way back to the beginning and watch Step 2 CK High Yield Facts Part 1. Be sure that you're subscribed to receive all of my latest videos, and I will catch you in the next one.